be talking about the life and times that Jane Austen lived in. So, Jane Austen, you might know her for her completed novels, which are Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, Northanger Abbey, Emma, and Man, wait, did I already say, Persuasion, that's the one I didn't say, there we are. So those are all of her completed works that she wrote in the Regency era. Now what is the Regency era? It is generally defined as a period of time starting in 1811 until the death of King George III. Now the Regency era is called the Regency because um, King George III, who was the Georgian era was named after, which was the period uh, in the mid to late 1700s, um, was no longer able to ru rule the country due to what they called madness, and he was called Mad King George. And it's not completely certain as to what mental illness he was suffering from, but there's a good deal of speculation. Anyway, he was unfit to rule the country, and therefore his son, who was also named George, Prince George, who was the Prince of Wales at that time, assumed control of the country, but since his father was not dead and did not abdicate to him, it was called the Regency period. So he was ruling instead for his father, who was still in title and name, kind of still the king, but was not actually doing any ruling or decision making for the country. So. That is the Regency era, and that is when Jane Austen was publishing her works. Her first work was actually published in 1811, and her first book was Sense and Sensibility. Now, it was originally called Eleanor and Marianne, which are the names of the two main characters, but then it was changed because there were the novels of sensibilities that she was kind of spoofing in this novel, um, because a lot of her novels are a critique on Regency era society and also late Georgian society, because she actually wrote, well, she wrote Pride and Prejudice first, and then she wrote Sense and Sensibilities in the 1790s. But Sense and Sensibilities was published first in 1811. Uh, yes. So, Sense and Sensibilities was published in 1811. Uh, it was very much a critique of Regency era society where Jane Austen was herself on the fringes of the gentry. Her father was a preacher and her mother had some aristocracy connections, but was not part of the aristocracy herself. And therefore, the novel Sense of Sensibilities really reflects that because you have um, a mother and her daughters who are dependent upon relations for survival because they, after their husband and or their father died, they had nothing. And that's really what was, Jane Austen saw herself in that because she knew that's what was going to happen to her and her mother and if any of her sisters went, were unmarried when her father died. So, <coughs> Uh, the reason for this economic dependence that these women had was because of what would be called entails. And an entail, which was a problem for many uh, women of the landed gentry class up until fairly recently, because uh, this is an issue in Sense and Sensibilities, this is an issue in Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> where you have this entail. Now, what is the entail? The entail is when British aristocracy or British landed gentry, when they died, or even if you just, if you were a middling sort of person when you died, you could, only, you could not divide your estate. All of your estate had to go to one person. And that one person was generally your oldest son. Uh, so that means your second son, your third son, your fifth daughter, your first daughter, all were going to be left practically nothing after the death of their father. So are you, are you like putting your life um, on your wife's uh, way to have like a closer to your wife? There we go. Is this better? Yeah. 
I think that might help. <laughs> okay. Hey, really? Yes, all right. Where were we? Entails. Entails. <laughs> Entails. We were at entails. So this is obviously a problem. Uh, and Jane Austen knew that this was going to be a problem for her when her father died. And it was going to be a problem for these characters in her novel. So basically, the only way for a woman to survive after the end, after her father's death, was to get married or to be dependent upon her brother who did receive the land or some other distant relation to provide them an income, uh, an allowance, some type of housing and or shelter. And this is a really a theme in a lot of Jane Austen's works because you have uh, Mrs. Bates and Emma who, when her father died, she had a vicarage, but then she, had, she was forced to move because it was left to Elton, or Sir Elton, or the, the preacher. So, in almost every single one of Jane Austen's novels, that is an occurring theme of women um, on the fringes of the gentry having to sort through their economic situation uh, because they could not, they could make money for themselves, but it was kind of frowned upon, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but they were really dependent upon some sort of family relation. So this also was a problem for anyone who did not inherit the entire estate. Um, so that was also a problem for like the second and third sons of whoever this was. Um, right now we're going to talk about Jane Austen's family. Uh, her father's estate went to her oldest brother but that also left her other brothers in a state of, well, what, what do we do? Because now we, we also don't have any inheritance, so we have to make our own way in our, the world. So they actually ended up joining the army and or navy, which during this time, uh, they had the Napoleonic Wars, and England was at war with France. And I'm going to let Glenn talk a little bit about the Napoleonic Wars. Certainly. So uh, as Marie said, the, the second, third, etc. sons had to find some way to make their their mark on the world and make their own way and, and have their own income. And, and a big way that they could do this was to join the military. Now, this, this landed aristocracy, these gentlemen, would not just up and join the army as privates. They would usually, almost 100% of the time, join the army as officers. And, of course, they would have to work their way up. Now, the interesting thing about the British Army at this time is, now, we'll come back to the Navy, but the army, people would purchase... Their commissions, their commission is what made them an officer. It was a writ from the king that said, you are hereby recognized as a lieutenant or a captain or a major or what have you. And the, uh, the oldest sons who had inherited would use some of their wealth to purchase these commissions for their younger brothers. And these younger brothers would then go into the army. And they would very, very often have no experience whatsoever from a military perspective and how to lead men and how to plan attacks and how to handle supplies and all these things they were very often thrust in and this is the the the, the uh, perception i should say of these men is of these officers is where you get the caricatures from this period of the 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 silly half-wit british second or third son in the army who's rather rides around and dash and goodness and we might have a drink and oh heavens there's the enemy let's charge right at them hey what 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 and this type of of officering is not usually very effective but the richest families could purchase the higher commission so of course the higher the rank the more this is going to cost and so the richest families are able to purchase the younger uh, brothers on up and on up at a certain point, however, you're not going to really be able to expand your rank beyond, say, a major or lieutenant colonel. At a certain point, the army is going to say, you're approaching a period where you're going to need to lead, actually lead, many men into combat and on a campaign. And so the very upper echelons of the British Army, the the, uh, brigadier, the brigadier generals, the lieutenant generals and things like that, the major generals, while they did usually get their commissions initially via purchase, they had shown some sort of aptitude and some sort of inherent talent for leadership on the battlefield and in these military campaigns. And most 
of the British Army at this time was serving in uh, Portugal and in Spain. The British Army is not very big. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, of course, in a nutshell, arise out of the rise of Napoleon, the French Revolution. Napoleon takes command of France, and he has a vision of uniting all of Europe under a democratic republican system. Something that we today may not necessarily disagree with, but he tended to try to accomplish this through conquest, and he used the French army. He was, without question, a military genius, and he had the French army with which to use as a tool to expand into all these different territories. So he had been very, very successful in conquering a great amount of Europe, and really the only ones that consistently were able to stand against him and stop him from total uh, conquest of the continent were the British. The British, but not the British Army. As I said, the British Army is very small, especially in comparison to so many of these European armies. The French Army could number 100, 200, 500,000 men. When Napoleon marches into Russia, he takes with him almost 600,000 men to give you an idea of how big the armies could get. The British armies in Spain and Portugal were very, very rarely ever more than 40 or 50,000 men, so not very big, but the British had the Navy, and it is the British Navy that really, well, the British Navy and the British purse. The, Britain was quite wealthy at the time, so they're able to take their fiscal power. They have lots of money. They can pay to have troops and supply the, the armies of other nations and their navy, which can control all the sea lanes, and this stops Napoleon from getting everything he wants. It certainly stops Napoleon from getting what he needs to invade England. And the British Navy is a little bit different. Within the British Navy, um, the purchase system is not in effect. Everyone who goes into the British Navy who is a young gentleman, no matter how young the gentleman, will be put to sea as a midshipman. And they may do that as early as 11, 12, 13 years old. And so they will stay in the Navy and they will continue. They have to pass a test to become a lieutenant, no matter how wealthy your family is, no matter how high your rank in the aristocracy, you have to pass a test to become a lieutenant. And once you're a lieutenant, your uh, promotions are based on merit and ability and success in leadership and in battle. So the British Navy is a very, very professional organization. And as a result, sometimes the upper ranks of the British Navy, like ship captains and even some admirals, are, are somewhat looked down upon frequently by those who, uh, who might be in the army who have risen to their rank through pay. And, and this seems very foreign to us, but this is the case. And so uh, in 1811, we are getting to the point where Napoleon is about to invade Russia. The British armies under Wellington in Spain have been very successful. Napoleon is kicked out of Russia. And at the Battle of Leipzig, uh, the, as also known as the Battle of Nations, he is defeated and is forced into exile. He comes back. The Hundred Days, we have the Battle of Waterloo for the British Army. It's the only major battle the British Army fights on the continent outside of Spain. Uh, after a hard-fought battle in one day, they're able to defeat Napoleon finally. And that sort of uh, sets up the end of the Napoleonic Wars. But this means that there's lots of uh, retired officers now who the Army doesn't need. But they're retired they're going to go back to their estates. They're going to have been uh, perhaps elevated in rank in the army. They're going to have gotten some notoriety if they're lucky, if they've applied themselves uh, to learn the military art, to be brave in battle. And, and quite frankly, there's also the possibility of loot during this time. If, a, if, a, if an army captures a very rich city or if a, if a uh, British ship captures another ship, and there are riches on it. That's divided between the crews and between the armies. So a soldier might go in, and that's his one great hope of becoming rich and being able to set himself up. But these Napoleonic Wars and the British soldiers and the British officers play um, sort of a big role. They're sort of the background of everything, I think, that goes on with, with Miss Austin. And they usually are portrayed as the least likely and, and least desirable mates. Yes, which brings us to Pride and Prejudice. Very uh, much so the least desirable mate in this one, uh, which an uh, officer ends up running away with one of the Bennett sisters because in this book, Pride and Prejudice, the main characters are Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennett, and one of her younger sisters does run away with an army officer who is 
it was quite scandalous, and the family didn't exactly care for him that much, no. <laughs> uh, to put it nicely. Uh, so very much the least desirable. But of course, the most desirable was Mr. Darcy. And this also shows how much economics also figured into Austen's things, because she did not shy away from telling us how much people made <laughs> at all. She was very, very uh, upfront about this is how much they made a year. Um, and that was supposed to mean something to the people who read these books and uh, tell them exactly where their rank in society was um, and exactly how much money they had and how that played into making matches and uh, who you want to marry. So of course Mr. Darcy, he made, I believe it was 15,000 pounds a year. And I did some math and that is about 1.2 million a year today. So if you if you think about that, quite the eligible bachelor. I would <laughs> quite say. the eligible bachelor, and that also is I think that's um, pretty much the the first line of uh, Pride and Prejudice is a man in possession of a great fortune must be in want of a wife. Uh, I'm not sure if he necessarily wanted one, but uh, I mean he obviously wanted Elizabeth Bennet by the end. But uh, it was you know if you had a great fortune, well uh, even if you didn't necessarily want a wife, a wife was probably going to try to find you because uh, if she was going to be left out of her father's will and not have any in, like income of her own, her only option was marrying well to a certain extent if you were part of the gentry or on the fringes of the gentry. Um, so let's see, we have, um, ah yes, so Mr. Darcy is often thought of as being inspired by the I wouldn't say the love of Jane Austen's life, but one of the men who um, she flirted quite uh, vigorously with um, for a time, um, and his name was Tom Lefroy, and I think they met at a ball or some sort of social event, very much like um, how Elizabeth Bennet meets Mr. Darcy for the first time. And it's very much, it's not proven as to how much this influenced Pride and Prejudice, but it is a coincidence that she was exchanging letters with Tom Lefroy and such during the time when she was writing Pride and Prejudice. So it had to, in, in, if, it, she, if she didn't consciously do it, I have to think that it influenced it a little bit, at least subconsciously, um, to put it at the very, very minimum. Other people believe that Mr. Darcy is definitely Tom Lefroy, and then Elizabeth Bennet is definitely Jane Austen. But it's very hard to say. Jane Austen, we know very, very little about her personal life because a lot of her family either burned or censored her letters at the, her death. Um, so we aren't completely sure how much she thought about this or how influential this was. Um, it's only speculation at this point. But Tom Lefroy did come from a very wealthy family. He ended up being a very, very powerful man. I think he was the Chief Justice of Ireland for a time. Uh, so he was very influential and he also admits to being infatuated with Jane Austen for a time. Uh, so there, it was very much, they, they had like a little thing, but we don't know how much of it was. Um, but it's really interesting because Jane Austen, we always think about her having these romance novels, but she never actually married. She actually did have a one-night engagement. She was at a friend's house with some of her, some of her lady friends and she was visiting there and their brother asked for her hand in marriage and she was about 27 at this time and he was a little bit her junior and she accepted because she knew this was probably going to be like her possibly her last chance at getting married and having a state of her own and a house of her own, which would probably seem desirable. But then she, after that night, she refused the proposal that she had already accepted and left the house very quickly uh, because you, you don't stay at a house, um, I think, after your friend's house after you've rejected their no, brother. That's um, bad form. Oh bad, bad, very, bad, very, very bad form. <laughs> so she, she left very quickly. And later she wrote, she rather not be married at all than be married without affection. Uh, so she valued love very highly and didn't want a, a loveless marriage that would be 
provide for her and give her a place of, to live, but not be an affectionate relationship. Um, there's also rumors that she fell in love with a preacher who died. There's not a lot of proof of that, but that's like an, an old family story of theirs that happened at some point. But I think it's just incredibly interesting that we think of Jane Austen as this romantic icon, but she never actually married. Um, yes, so that brings us to her third novel that was published, which was Emma. Uh, Emma is very popular at the moment. It just had a movie come out with another adaption, which I personally, I'm not sure if you saw it, but I incredibly okay. liked it because I think it captured what Emma is all about, which is very much kind of a satire on the higher up uh, class, if you will. Um, but also it's also considered one of Jane Austen's greatest works by critics because it was, it's, domestic realism at its best. <laughs> so it's very interesting. We have, you know, Emma Woodhouse who likes to make matches for everyone. We have Harriet Smith who is also one of the characters that is also on like the fringes of the gentry because she has a questionable past which gets revealed later. But, or questionable parentage, she doesn't have a questionable past, but a questionable parentage which does get revealed later. We also have one of the few um, farmers that appear in um, Jane Austen's novels with uh, the farmer Martin, which uh, Harriet does end up with. Um, I'm sorry if these are any of these are spoilers, but these have been out for about 200 years. <laughs> so <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, but being a woman writer in Regency era England was a very interesting thing to be. Uh, Jane Austen, none of, her name did not appear on any of her novels that were published during her lifetime. They were only, they were published anonymously and they said, by a lady. Which speaks to a lot of different things. Because she was on the fringes of the gentry, it, if it said it was by a lady, it does, um, it makes people think that she is of an upper class. Uh, it keeps her name out of the public sphere, which um, she didn't necessarily want or didn't think was proper. And it also, um, it implies that she was not writing for profit, but writing just because she could. Uh, that she was writing because this was a fun pastime for her, which I'm sure it was, um, but it took away the idea that she was going to try to support herself as a writer um, and to be a professional writer. Even though she was a professional writer, she did make money for her books and she managed her copyrights and things on her own, which was also fairly unusual because usually if a woman did publish anything, it was a male relation who would go and try to negotiate the royalties and stuff for her. But she did that on her own and she made money and she wanted to make money because she, I think after her father's death, she was allowed 20 pounds a year uh, to buy clothes and other such things. But she, I believe for Sense and Sensibilities or Pride and Prejudice, she made around 140 pounds for the copyright. Um, and she also realized there's different ways of publishing and either you could just completely sell the copyright and then you just got the money for the copyright or you could publish it um, in the, and then you would get like royalties like we, we would think of today. Um, but the author had to put up enough money to where if all of the printed books um, did not sell, they could cover them so the publisher didn't lose any money. So. At one point, she did have to, she had to put up money, and we aren't exactly sure where she got it, um, to, to publish her novels, uh, which is also very interesting. But <clears throat> uh, she was, it was, her name only appeared on her books postmortemously after her death, like quite a while after her death. But she's never been out of print. Um, and in the Regency era, she was not like this literary icon that we think of her as today, but she was a popular writer. People knew of Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice was probably her most popular book uh, while she was alive. Um, and then in the 1830s, uh, 
they were also popular, they were being printed in volumes, but she didn't reach what I would consider like the global celebrity status that we think of her t like today until the 1870s when her nephew published a book about Jane Austen, about his aunt who was this writer in Regency era England, and then that book got really popular, which made her books really popular. And then they skyrocketed from there and we've had movie adaptations almost every single generation, um, mini series and such that have been incredibly influential um, from these works that this woman published in the early 1800s. I also think it's incredibly interesting. She published, uh, I think there was two or th three or four before her death. And then two, were pub two of her novels were published post-mormously um, after her death because she died rather young. She was only around 40 when she died, um, rather unexpectedly. She wasn't like considered a sickly person, um, but she did end up dying um, in, I believe, 1816. And then uh, Persuasion was published after her death, and also, I believe, Northanger Abbey was published after her death. Um, so she really, she was writing her entire life. There's also um, a bu book that was called Juvenilia, which is just an assortment of her writings as a child um, that was also published. So she, she was always loved writing, always was very interested in literature, but she didn't publish, start publishing her novels until 1811. Um, and it, I would assume she would probably have had plans to publish more novels if not for her untimely death. Um, Do you know how she died? It, just some sort of disease. Oh. I'm not sure. She, she got sick and died. I'm not uh, completely sure. They also had some funny names for diseases back then. Yes. Yeah, um, they, they, did, they did, wouldn't necessarily understand what, as we would call it, a comorbidity that, that might be extant. They would just say, oh, she had a fainting spell and passed away from it. Or consumption. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just died of consumption because something, they're like, this was some sort of disease and we aren't sure what it was, so we're going to call it yes, consumption. Because they coughed a lot. <laughs> a lot of tuberculosis, it, you, you find out tuberculosis was consumption, mm -hmm. but that's not always what that means. Right. So it's confusing to read what people died of from back then because you aren't, sometimes it's not clear. Um, I think the last book we're going to talk about in relation to the Regency era is Northanger Abbey, which is one of the ones that was published postmortemously, and that is a critique of the Gothic novel. Now, the Gothic novel <laughs> was also incredibly popular, and if you aren't sure exactly what a Gothic novel is, think Frankenstein, which was also published by a female writer, Mary Shelley, um, but this was, Frankenstein was actually published after uh, Jane Austen died. I think it was 1817 that Frankenstein was published, but, or written, and then it was published in 1818. Anyway, Jane Austen never got to read Frankenstein, but she, the Gothic novel, that genre of literature was incredibly popular, and I don't think Jane Austen took too kindly to it, um, but she did find it kind of fascinating to a certain extent, but she didn't consider it, like, good reading. Uh, completely because it's so sensation it was very sensationalized you would have like these monsters like frankenstein and vampires and that's all that uh this imagination run wild kind of idea um which her main her heroine catherine in northanger abbey saw uh, or thought she was envisioning um these fantastical things where it, it really it it was just normal people doing normal life things. Um, so you have that critique of the gothic novel, of the sensationalized uh, world. But also I think it's incredibly interesting that it takes place at an abbey, which is an old gothic style building. From what we can tell, Northanger Abbey is probably one of the, if we're talking about architectural settings for Jane Austen, it's probably one of the oldest buildings. And it was probably, I think it was said in the novel that it came into the family uh, in the 18, sorry, sorry, 1530s, 1540s, 
when Henry VIII broke with the church in Rome, established his own church, the Church of England, Anglicanism, uh, and then you had the dissolution of the monasteries because those were associated with the church in Rome, and then King Henry VIII could get the buildings and the land and use it for his own, own reasons, or he could award it to different nobility that he who had supported him through that hard break with the church and Roman marrying his new wife Anne Boleyn. So that's also an interesting facet that you can see the uh, history and architecture uh, working, the Gothic architecture working with the critique on the Gothic novel. Um, so I think she was very interesting of her to pick that for the setting of that novel. And I think, oh yes, we can talk about questions we, or fashion? Okay, sure. Yeah. Oh, unless you had something else? Oh, I was going to talk about what we were wearing. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm sure they would love it. In <laughs> fact, one of our, um, one of our uh, viewers would love to see the fan. If oh, this is my fan. <laughs> yes, you, uh, I'm sure they'd be interested in the fashion as well. Yes, so the Regency era fashion was a complete break with what had come before. What had come before is like if you think of Marie Antoinette and her grand panniers and her stays and the hair that went up to here. Um, so that uh, all went away with the guillotine. And then no one wanted to look like people who had gotten guillotined. So people drastically changed their fashion to resemble more of a Roman Republic uh, kind of feel of this rebirth of democracy and such. Um, People wanted to emulate that. So you have very like free-flowing like dresses uh, with an empire waist is what we call this today. Um, shorter sleeves were okay. Necklines came lower. Of course, if you were during the day, like we're having tea here, so this is you know a good afternoon uh, activity. So I would I have my um, my tuck thing here that, that to cover. Um, but if I wanted to wear this later in the evening, I could take that off um, and then be a little, have a little more skin showing for dinner or something like that. Um, this is my shawl. It's um, a rectangular piece of fabric that you kind of drapes over um, as you have it. I have these long white gloves, which are also covering my skin, um, but I could take them off for uh, dinner. But also if you were going to a ball or something, you would always wear gloves. Um, also, hair became more natural um, instead of powdered and done up um, like the Marie Antoinette style. Um, everything became a little bit more loose and free-flowing uh, in terms of a, a good many things, but uh, flat fashion really showed that um, and showed how this was a complete break with the past. A lot of women, they would wear stays, um, which is kind of like a pre-runner to a corset. But then during this time period, that also kind of went away and you had Regency era stays, which could be much shorter and were very much look like what you would consider a brazier today. Um, uh, for underpinnings and such, you would have like petticoats and chemises um, and things still, but it was all to provide a very loose, very flowing um, type of um, ideal and as well as going back to like the Greek uh, white dresses were incredibly popular and also if you kind of like uh, if a lady was to stand up she almost kind of looked like a pillar um, in, in her white and it looked very much kind of like the the pillars of Greece and Rome and such so that I think that's about it for women's fashion if you would like to talk about gentlemen's fashion let's see I might have to stand up because <laughs> uh, the the, men, the men's clothing was not quite as free-flowing <laughs> as the women's turned out to be. This is the period, that, as she said, that was sort of ostentatious uh, earlier on, but this is the time period that the suit of clothes sort of came in. It was a coat, it was trousers, it was a waistcoat. Um, the trousers, uh, unlike the uh, earlier period, go all the way down to the ankle. They don't stop at the knee. I'm wearing boots with these. They have a, a front that buttons and drops down. I'll have a waistcoat, just a we would call it a vest today, and the coat, of course, is a tail coat, um, has long tails in the back, um, has false pockets that buttons across, and, and notice how, how high the waist goes. 
so that you can, I can show off my waistcoat that I'm wearing underneath. Of course, the, the neck collar is going to keep my head up straight and sort of match everything. This big, fancy collar that goes with this coat. This was not a universal, but it was considered the height of fashion. The tall hat. Uh, and, of course, an accessory, I would always have some sort of walking cane and out like that. This is, uh, as w when we came in here, I said, this is not exactly an outfit for sitting down in, but I will nevertheless <laughs> sit back down. So the, uh, so the fashion, I, I think it's really neat. Um, it can be comfortable. It, it certainly looks dashing. Um, but the, uh, the male, I think the male clothing actually becomes more restrictive mm -hmm. between, um, say, the... Um, you know, the, the colonial period, the American colonial period, the, the 1700s and up, when you get to this period, the, the idea, I think, is to uh, sort of show the trim up of the male figure much more closely. This is also the time period where men also sometimes wore corsets uh, to keep in the gut because you are showing off your that area right. uh, quite prominently, and um, that was a, a thing that... Right. No, haven't. It would be improper to wear the hat inside. It would be. It would be. I'm only wearing this to sort of complete the ensemble, but I would certainly take the hat off and hand it. In a house like this, I'm sure I would hand it off to a servant uh, before I come and sit down, and then I would have this. This is actually my haircut is appropriate for this time period. It's somewhat short, uh, somewhat easy to take care of. <laughs> All right, so we've got some questions, yes. um, but Glenn, if you wouldn't mind giving us some historical context of this era, what's going on around people in Jane Austen's world in England at this time? Uh, well, as I said, everything at this point is being driven by the Napoleonic Wars. These are, uh, they begin with the French Revolution. We say Napoleonic, but they, they started even before that, even before Napoleon came on the scene in the 1780s when France which had ironically helped the United States in its revolution against a monarchy, decides that it would like to throw off its monarchy and become a, a more free, uh, democratic, and republican state. It doesn't go as smoothly in France as it does in the United States, and it leads to a, a vast bloodletting of the French aristocracy. And people begin, uh, and the other monarchs of Europe take exception to this. You have to remember that Almost every single nation in Europe at this time is a monarchy of one sort or the other. They don't want to see a, a, a form of government that does not have a monarch at the top because sort of like that domino theory from the Cold War I was talking about the other day, you're afraid if one country goes Republican and gets rid of their king, then they're all going to do that. So the, the countries of Europe very much are against France, but France is centrally located on the continent. It has a significant amount of wealth, and this revolutionary ardor that fills the French people gives them a, a huge morale and a huge spirit to go and spread Republican ideals. This war that leads into the Napoleonic Wars, these last for about 25 years, again, depending upon how you count it. And you have to put yourself in the mindset that these are literally considered by the people who are involved to be wars of annihilation and wars of national survival and ideology. So these are incredibly long, they're incredibly bloody, they're incredibly expensive. And every part of society is involved in trying to carry these wars forward. And they, and they just, it seems like to them, they just keep going. And eventually even the French people tire of war and want to end the war in any way. And, it's, and, and there are other things, of course, going on around the world, but the Napoleonic conflict, uh, which is, you could term a world war and a very, very significant one. It's almost a total war. Uh, that does frame everything from this entire period. Samantha would like to know, how was it decided that someone was a lord or a duke? Was it money status or something the king bestowed on you and your family? Ah, yes. So, it would be something that the king... Ah, yes. So how do you become like a lord, a duke, uh, an earl, or how do you become aristocracy? And that is uh, the king, probably a very, very long time ago, would have uh, given your family, uh, if you were trying to get, le if you had like a lot of land, they would give you, or you'd ne you wouldn't have land necessarily before, but sometimes. Uh, but the king would then bestow upon you, like you are now the duke of Northumberland, Congratulations, you have this large estate, you're going to look after this piece of land for me. And then from then on, it would be hereditary until your line 
died out and then the duke the king may or may not appoint someone else but usually they would find some relation uh, to fill the position that was from that family's bloodline so it's very much it's not something you can get into easily um, it was something that you were probably going to have to be born into okay and um how old was jane austen when she started writing so how old was jane austen when she started writing she was writing from the time i think she could hold a pencil um, she was born in, I believe, 1775? We are going to fact check that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes. aha, I was Ooh, correct. She got it. <laughs> yes, all right. So Jane Austen was born in 1775, which was a very significant year in the American Revolution. Um, but Britain was still kind of chilling over there. I mean, obviously, we've, America was trying to gain their independence from them, but she was just born, so she had no idea that was going on. But uh, I think she was pretty, as soon as she could learn how to read and write and form sentences, um, I think she was writing, because you have that whole book called Juvenalia, which is just her writing stories and letters and such from the time when she was a young child. So story writing had always been a part of her life, um, and it she started writing her first novels in the 1790s, so she would have been around 20, I think, when she start, first started writing Pride and Prejudice. Um, but then they weren't published for another 10, 15 years after she had started writing them. Can you describe her education? Her education? So how, how is Jane Austen probably educated? Um, Again, we don't know a whole, whole lot about her life because her family destroyed a good many of her letters and or censored them. What we can gather from the knowing about what the time was like at during the Regency era when she was alive or the late Georgian period when she was probably receiving most of her what we would consider formal education was probably that of her older brothers, a governess, her mother, um, or something of that. I don't think she attended a particular school necessarily. Um, her education was probably mostly at home um, from her families, if they had books, if they had a library. Uh, her brothers were probably more educated or more formally educated and such. I don't think she ever, she never went to university or anything of that sort because I, the first women's university to ever grant degrees to women was actually here in Georgia, mm -hmm. um, Wesleyan College, but that wasn't until the 1830s, so she, it was too early for that for her. Yeah, most, most women would, even, even the uh, aristocracy would at best get a primary education. There was no higher learning. They certainly didn't go to, to university mm -hmm. or anything like that. And um, so why is this era called the Regency era? Yeah, so this is called the Regency era, the Regency era because this is uh, what you would call a regent. So a regency was going on during this period. And what that is, is King George III, who was king during the Georgian period that America won their independence from, that King George had gone mad. Uh, we aren't exactly sure what his mental illness was or what his mental problems were. Uh, there's a lot of speculation upon that, but it was clear that he was unfit to make decisions and rule England and Great Britain. Therefore, his son, who was also named George, Prince George, took over ruling for his father, making the decisions because his father was unable to do so, but his father was also not in a, a place to abdicate or hand over um, the authority to his son because of his dis disability. Therefore, it was a regency because he was ruling in his father's stead, but his father still was entitled king. He was still the prince, but he was the prince regent, which means he was prince and his dad was still king, but the prince was making all the decisions for the country. <clears throat> and that is why it's called the Regency period, is because that's when the prince took over making decisions for the country in his father's stead until and it ends when his father died. And then he assumed um, the title of king because he was next in line. And then, and I believe that was in the 1830s. And that's generally when 
the Regency era is thought to end. And that, and that the Regency period is a very British centric um, categorization of this time period. For example, in, in the United States, it was called the Federalist period because that was when the federal government was taking over. In France, it's the reign of Napoleon, but but. Today it's the Regency because it's Jane Austen. We're in Britain today. <laughs> so why did her family destroy the letters or censor them? So why did her family censor these letters or destroy these letters? I honestly don't know. I can only speculate because they also didn't write anything about why they did it. <laughs> uh, I assume it's because they were very private people. Um, from some of what I had read, it seemed that anything that reflected negatively upon the family, they got rid of because they wanted to make sure that everyone thought Jane Austen, or um, if Jane Austen was to criticize a family member in the letter, they got rid of that because they didn't want that published. They didn't want it to be look like Jane Austen had this... Uh, problem with their family um, and of course you know I assume it's it's like any type of family that everyone has their disagreements or problems at some point or another but also very much uh, it was a loving family as well we know she was very very close to her sister Cassandra and Cassandra is the one who destroyed most of the, the letters um, and they were almost inseparable. It was written about them later that it was a very, very, uh, very close and very loving relationship that these two sisters had. Um, so I don't know if it was Cassandra did it on the direction of Jane, if Jane didn't want her private letters to exist after her death, or if Cassandra did it thinking she was protecting the memory of Jane or the memory of their family. Um, so th there's no clear answer, it's just, speculation. Were her bo uh, books controversial during her time? Were Jane Austen's books controversial during her time? From what I can tell, n not like in a, in a bad way. They poked fun and criticized some of the aristocracy, but in a very British way. Um, <laughs> Jane Austen was not a revolutionary in any sort. She didn't want to get rid of the aristocracy, but she did think some things the aristocracy did were silly. So uh, she, she, was not, she, she did not enjoy the rattle of the guillotine and she didn't think uh, they should get a, do away with the king or the regent necessarily, at least from anything that we can read in her books. But she did think some of the things that they did were uh, silly, but they were also very popular with the elite because the elite were the ones who could read and buy these books, who had enough money and leisure time to to read and uh, to buy these. So I would, I would say they were not necessarily controversial in, in a sense of uh, great controversy. Of course, you know, critics said one thing or another because, you know, crit critics have to give their opinion and uh, sometimes it's favorable and sometimes not. But her, her early work was generally well uh, received by critics and Emma was incredibly well received by critics. I would think that would, that's the one that probably pokes the most fun at the aristocracy, um, and they loved it. If she never married, who did she live with throughout her life, or did she live alone? So where did Jane Austen live throughout her life since she never married? That's a very good question. She was raised, um, her father was a preacher, and they had like a country parish that he preached at, and that's where they lived for a good portion of her life. And then her father decided that they were going to move to Bath, England um, from their country home. And Jane Austen hated Bath. She did not write like anything there. Um, and when she left, she said she felt like she had escaped. But they lived um, in a rented flat, in a rented house there. And they went because her mother was in ill health and they thought Bath was an incredibly uh, if you go there now, you can see the, um, the work of Regency architects and the work of, uh, it was incredibly uh, progressive town at the time. Uh, ev ev lots of things were going on in Bath. It was very much a metropolis center. They also had the Roman baths, which even going back to like Roman times, when the baths were built, uh, it was built with this spring water that thought uh, it would do the mom uh, Mrs. 
often uh, good to go and bathe in this bath water and bath uh, to get well. So they lived there for a period of time and then they moved um, back to uh, a country. They, they also moved to a couple different places as well um, because at that point after the, her father died they were dependent upon some relation to give them a place to stay um, and I believe she uh, so they lived at several different places and then they came and she lived her final years of her life at Chatsworth House which was more in the country which was very much more to her liking she didn't like the city that much but did she live alone oh did she did not live alone she would li she lived with her mother Okay. Um, and unmarried family members. Okay. Uh, what is your personal favorite Jane Austen novel uh, and why? <laughs> My personal favorite is Sense and Sensibilities. I love the dichotomy of Eleanor and Marianne. I think it's, it's so fun because, you know, Marianne's this, she's the sensibility, she follows her heart, and Marianne's very logical and straightforward, and I think it's one of the first times I fell in love with Jane Austen was staying up very late and watching a BBC miniseries on Sense and Sensibilities. And I, that's when I fell in love with Jane Austen. And I, so it, that one's probably, I, I would say, my favorite. But I also do love Pride and Prejudice. Um, I also think that one's wonderful. I mean, like, they're all really good, but Sense and Sensibilities is my favorite. Is there one that you would suggest to start with if you've never read Austen? Ah. I think the one I first read was Pride, hmm, that's a hard one. I would probably start with Sense and Sensibilities or Pride and Prejudice because those are two very famous ones, um, or maybe even Emma. I wouldn't read Northanger Abbey, Mansfield Park, or Persuasion first because those are very much, I would consider more dense and more, I think you get more out of them after having read the other possibly more famous Austin. And talking about the, the, excuse me, the daily life, um, could you describe the differences between daily life of a gentry woman and a gentry man? Um, so a gentry woman, um, she didn't do a whole lot. <laughs> um, her, her whole position was so that she could be idle. Um, the basically the success and wealth, the more success like the, in land and wealth you had, the more idle the woman could be, and then therefore she could fill her days doing whatever she wanted. Uh, so she could go and she could have tea. She could have, go calling on neighbors. Uh, she could uh, paint. She could do some type of embroidery. She wouldn't have to sew her own clothes. She would probably have someone do that for her and it'd probably be in bad taste if she, you know, sewed, sewed her own clothing because that means you couldn't pay someone else to do it. So she would probably just, um, she could read books, um, write books as Jane Austen did, but if you published them for money then you were considered not gentry because then that was considered the woman working and that was considered, considered lowering your status because the whole idea is of being the gentry woman was not working and not having to physically do anything. Um, was that, that kind of idea. Um, if you ever want to know exactly what a gentry woman would do, uh, read Emma. That will tell you everything a gentry woman would probably do. And what about the, uh, the, uh, the gentleman would in effect, be the business manager. If he's, again, the, the more wealthy he is, the more uh, landed estate he has, it's going to be his job to sort of oversee it. Now, he is, by no stretch of the imagination, going to be physical and, and get dirty and, and do anything like that. That would, be un, that would be unseemly and only available as a, sense of, as a scene of humor in one of Jane Austen's <laughs> books. But he's going to be on horseback. He's going to be riding around his estates to make sure that his respective overseers or farmers are doing what they need to do. He's going to be at home in his study, counting his monies, making sure that expenses are getting paid, making sure that his money is coming in, making sure that the money is going out in an effective manner. He's going to be uh, hobnobbing, doing gentlemanly things like perhaps gambling in the evening, uh, going to horse races, not racing himself, but watching the horse races. Uh, and if he happens to have any sort of uh, civic duty, for example, he's a member of parliament or something like that, 
he will, of course, go and take care of, take care of those things. Uh, but it's, uh, they'll be busier than, than their female counterparts, but it's still not any physical labor. Their, their days may be full of things to do, but it's going to be very much business management type things. Yes, and while they took care, the gentleman would take care of like the business side, a lot of times it was fall to lady to be more of the social side. So uh, to go to balls and to have host dinner parties and such, which were uh, the, the social sphere is where the lady would thrive as well. Were there other prominent female writers around her time? So the question was uh, other prominent female writers um, in the Regency era. So one that we had mentioned before was Mary Shelley. And she was actually, Mary Shelley is the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote The Vindications of the Rights of Women during the French Revolution in response to the Vindication of the Rights of Man. There are also, I think, I had never heard of them, but I wrote down their names. Um, there were a couple other uh, female writers during their time, but they did not, they did not have the lasting impression that Jane Austen had, but there were others. Um, they just did not necessarily stand the test of time. The first woman writer in Britain was named Alpha, Alpha Bren, I think I'm pronouncing that wrong, or right, I don't know. Um, but she wrote The Rover, and that was in 1677, and that was really considered the first female British writer who paved the way for these other women uh, to publish their writings and to get published. Okay, a few more questions, but then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, so did she write poetry or any other writings other than her novels? So did Jane write, Austen write anything besides her novels, or did she write poetry or such? That was the question. Um, not necessarily that we can find that was published, but of course I go back to the, her juvenilia, which were, were stories and poems and letters. So I'm sure she wrote them, but I don't think they were, they weren't what her, her bread and butter will say. They weren't her main form of craft. All right, and last question is, uh, where did you get your costumes? And we also want to know what book that is that you have there. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> so this book here is... The Great Works of Jane Austen. So it's my volume that has uh, most, I think, all of her completed novels. Yes, well, it has four. It has Northanger Abbey, Persuasion, uh, Pride and Prejudice, and Sense and Sensibilities. And I think that's, yes, those are the four that are in here. And then I made my outfit. Um, and yeah, I, I made it. That's where I got it. <laughs> and Blue, where did oh, you get Marie is very talented and makes a great many things. I made none of what I am wearing. I, uh, I, I purchased most of my things um, hither and yon, different places, uh, so I sort of have to, to put things together and catch as catch can. I don't have the, the talents that Marie does. Okay. And uh, last question is, can you talk about the customs of a tea, of having tea with, in a social setting? Ah, yeah. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I, will, I will let you talk about that. I, I only know how to drink it, not how to perform. So um, there's a good many things about tea and like what you would think of tea. And if you have tea at what time, time of day, you have tea at... There, there's a whole, whole, whole thing that goes along, along with tea. Uh, I was actually just reading about tea uh, the other day, so this is good. But... Um, <laughs> You, you know, you would have your selections of tea. If you're having like tea with breakfast, you'd probably have, you know, a nice English breakfast tea. Uh, we were going to have like a nice afternoon tea, which is tea that probably doesn't have as much caffeine in it. Um, and all of this tea, this became very fashionable because England was also, um, during this portion, uh, doing a good bit of colonialization. Uh, one of their colonies or trade uh, where they would extract um, resources from was India and uh, they had a lot of tea there that they would then bring back and it was very fashionable. A lot of things that were from India became incredibly popular in Britain during this time. Tea is kind of one of those. It was even popularized even more when Queen Victoria was going to have tea um, and the more formal, I think, idea of a tea party or the very formal idea of British tea happened during the Victorian era. Uh, 
Um, they still had tea, but a lot of the tea rules that we think of probably were not in full swing and full effect during the Regency era. Of course, you would still, you know, you would be very proper. Uh, you would want to, uh, you, would, you would come, you know, we would be dressed nicely for tea. It would be a whole uh, affair where you have, you know, we have your ch nice china. You would have your, like your sugar and your cream. Um, you would have, you know, the boiling, boiling hot water. Uh, depending upon your situation and status, is if a servant would pour the tea or if the lady would pour the tea. Um, also, I learned, uh, so it depends on like how fine of china you had as to if you put like the cream in before you put the hot water in. So because if you put hot water in without the cream and you had like bad china, it would break and it crack. So you knew how fine a person's china was if they put the cream in before or if they put the water in before. <laughs> so you knew, like, that was like a class thing. Um, and of course, then you would have, like, sugar. And I think just, like, how much, like, other things you had with your tea. So if you had, you know, your sandwiches and your little, like, uh, pastries and such, and, like, how grand that was was also probably going to be a status symbol of, like, look, I'm providing you with this many yummy treats or we just have sandwiches today like you know um and it would very much be a, uh, it would depend upon your social economic status and also just um the times all right, that's it. All, right. Thank you all right thank you all so much for tuning in to the world of jane austen and hopefully we'll see you again for yes, another thank, webcast absolutely mm -hmm. thank you we have uh we we're going to publish our schedule uh very soon of our next two weeks worth of broadcast here we're going to keep doing these uh, to help everyone at home and to help all the school uh, distance learning and things like that. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you for joining us at the Northeast Georgia History Center again. If you can support us in any way, uh, two things you can do. Number one, tell all your friends, all your family, all your contacts about us so they can also tune in and see our educational programming. And if you're able, you can go to our website, make a donation, click that donate button and help us keep these programs moving forward. Until we see you next time, Everyone have a great weekend and take care.